Our Father in heaven, thank you so very much for your kindness and your graciousness to us. Lord, I, I feel this cool breeze that's uh, blowing through my backyard right now. And I imagine um, that this is, uh, it, it's as easy as, as, as sending the wind for you, Lord, to send the spirit of revival. Send the spirit of revival into, into my heart and into my brothers and sisters who are with me right now. Holy Spirit, we are dependent on you and we recognize that only you can give us eyes to see and ears to hear. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. You are the Almighty. You are our loving creator and you can recreate our homes. You can bring a new heavens and a new earth to our world just as easily as you send this cool breeze. Holy Spirit, fall fresh on us tonight. Fill us with joy and peace in believing, leaning not on our own understanding, but in all our ways, acknowledging you, knowing that you will direct our path. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, if you're like me, uh, you're excited to talk, uh, excited to uh, hear more about this monument. I, I've been looking at this thing for 10 years, the real one in Massachusetts. Some of you have visited it. This is just my, my replica that I had the sculptors from Lord of the Rings uh, sculpt for me so that you could have this uh, right in front of you if you want to in your home, with your family, with your friends. Uh, and if you're able to go to Massachusetts, go see this. Again, it's 90 feet tall. It's... it's uh, I, it's tons and tons of granite. Abraham Lincoln was one of the very first funders to the, to the building of this. It was gonna be twice as tall as it, as it is, but it was cut short by the Civil War. And if you were to stand next to this, this 90 foot structure, you'd come up to right here. Uh, it's, it's very, very large. And we talked about how the core and the center of this recipe for a free and just society of our forefathers starts with this central figure of faith and she's holding the book that she has faith in and she's pointing to the God that she has faith in. It's the God of the Bible and she has a biblical worldview and her faith is manifested first through morality who is seated right here and she's holding the Ten Commandments and the scroll of Revelation representing the Old and New Testament. And morality begins with a transformation of the heart by the preaching of the gospel which comes from the evangelist seated here, uh, right at her left. And once you have good morality, then you can begin to form your laws in the country. And here's the man of law who's seated on the judge's chair holding the book of law. His hand is outstretched in mercy. He's holding on to the laws that are balanced by both justice on his right and mercy on his left. Once you have civility in your society, now you can begin to educate your children. And here is the third manifestation of this beautiful faith, and her name is Education. I'm gonna show her to you really uh, up close, and there it says Education. In fact, I th do I have that? I think I need to switch that around because I've got it inverted. I'm gonna make sure that I switch this for you. Let's see, boom, there we go. And so there is Education, now you can read it education and she's holding the books of knowledge. She's got a wreath of victory around her head, that laurel wreath. And if you look to her right, there's a youth. Uh, it says right there, youth. And she's training up her child in the way that he or she should go so that when they are old, and if you look there on her left side, it says wisdom. And wisdom is uh, the goal. And he's holding a globe and a Bible indicating that he has a biblical worldview. And so they believe that if you would train your children in a biblical faith with a, a true morality that reflects the, re the morality of heaven, the virtue of the heavens, and you put those laws into place to protect the good and punish the evil, to hold back wickedness, you can educate your children into the second and third generation. And with that generational strategy, that is your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids, you wind up with wisdom and a biblical worldview. This is the, 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 the foundation and the cornerstone of what makes America work. And it leads to the blessings and the liberty that we'll talk about tomorrow evening. But as regard, with regard to education, I wanna talk with you about the forefathers and foremothers understanding of education, what it is and what it isn't, and how that carried through to the, founding, to the founder's generation. 
I'm uh, again looking into the American Covenant. Uh, I've got the old school version. Uh, here's the new one if you haven't gotten it yet. And I'm going to read this to you from Dr. Marshall Foster. Check this out. He says, we win the battle for our culture gener generationally. You see, it's not just uh, one guy, one woman who wins the battle for the hearts and minds of our kids. It's something that all of us do over the course of 20 years, 40 years, 60 years, 80 years. We need to be together not just for 100 days, we need a 100 year plan if we really want to see the blessings that our forefathers and foremothers envisioned. In fact, what the seeds that they planted gave us those blessings, but we've no longer been watering those same seeds and we need to replant them. It's a, a generational discipling, especially of our children. We think of discipleship as something maybe we do at church, but it's primarily meant to be done at home. You have, your children are your disciples for 18 years. Can you imagine? If you had the chance to disciple some, some young people for 18 years, you do. It's your kids. And up until the 1900s, you know, we, we had about 2,000 years where the family was together every night. This is before Snapchat, before uh, the, the nightly news, before TV, before, before all of that stuff gathering together every night around the fire or around the fireplace, talking. And people shared stories. And they learned about God's history. And they taught their children the scriptures. That's what they did. That's how they wind up knowing this stuff. That's why they love it. Because they were, they were drinking from the well, from, the, from the, the fountainhead of wisdom and truth, God's word, and learning and teaching and singing together around campfires and fireplaces and candles. And that's what you and I have been doing at the American Campfire Revival, if, if we really think about it. For the last hundred days, we've been gathering around a fire. Here it is. Oh, well, we've got it. It's behind here. We got our fire. We're gathering around and we're, and we're learning stories of God's history, of his mighty deeds. We're, we're sharing the scriptures with one another. And uh, we're doing that with our families and we're doing it with our friends. This is fantastic. Dr. Foster says, perhaps the number one priority that we should have after getting right with the Lord ourselves is the recapturing of the hearts and minds of our children from capturing them from what? Recovering them from what? From the perverted teachings of government schools. Oh, did I say that? I, I, I did. Public schools have become government education camps. Now, let me ask you, does that mean that, uh, that you can't be a believer or your kids are not going to grow up with faith? No, but it's going to be a lot harder. I remember a pastor once saying, if you send your children to Caesar to be educated, don't be surprised if they come back Romans. Listen to that again. If you send your children to Caesar to be educated, that's the government, don't be surprised if they come back Romans. It's a discipleship program. That's what it is. And so it makes it much, much more difficult. Listen to this. The Scottish people were very big on education. The believers in the family of faith were, were very keyed in to the importance of dis discipling their children. And they, uh, some of them there signed the National Covenant of Scotland about 400 years ago. We're talking about the American Covenant. They had the, the National Covenant of Scotland and all the faithful believers in Scotland signed it. Many of them used their own blood as ink. They were serious as a heart attack about telling the king and the king's army that there was no way that they would ever again allow their children to be forced into the king's schools that were teaching them to hate God or to twist the truth about who God is and about what his word says. They said, no, we won't allow it. And for signing this document of educational freedom from government educations, tens of thousands of Scots were hunted down and killed or exiled from the kingdom, from the country. And Dr. Foster says this, and I agree. We right now are at that same educational turning point 
in our country. If we do not recapture the minds and the hearts of our children and turn them back to this glorious faith, to the foundations that gave us our liberties, liberty from internal power of sin and external power of tyrants, we will lose it. It's now or never. I don't think that's overstating it. It's now or never to save our children's minds and souls from progressive education and its death grip on the minds of 66 million students that they control. Now, I know that there are good people. We have brothers and sisters in the family of faith who are in public schools doing the very best they can. That's their mission field to try to bring truth into these places and shine light in dark places. And God bless you for doing that. My dad's a teacher, my grandparents are teachers. But again, there is such, such an overwhelming tsunami of anti-everything you and I love and cherish being taught to our children, where good is being called evil and evil is being called good. Morality is being turned upside down and they're being taught to, to hate the very country that has given us freedoms to be able to elect our leaders and, and create our own laws and to be self-governing and to educate our children in the way that we want to with our values. That's being taught, they're, they're indoctrination camps, they're discipleship camps. And right now we still have the constitutional freedom, it's still on the laws, it's still legal for us to pull our children out and place our children in schools that teach them what you and I love and believe. Into homeschools. If you've never really looked deeply into homeschooling, my wife and I thought it was crazy until we realized that we only had a certain amount of time to be able to teach our children and spend developing relationships with them before they were out of the house. And there's an unbelievably wonderful, freeing, liberating movement of homeschool families all throughout the United States and around the world that I believe is one of the great hopes for revival in our nation. And we can still do that. We can train our children up in the way that they should go so that they will not depart from it. That's a promise from God. We must train up our kids in the way that they should go. Dr. Foster concludes by saying that the covenant, the covenant that we've been talking about is the foundation of all the spheres of the battle. If we're going to battle for education for our kids, if we're gonna battle for the morality and virtue of our children, if we're gonna battle out the laws through politics, if we're gonna battle for, for our rights and our freedoms, he says that the prep for winning the battle starts in the home around the fire. The preparation for winning the battle starts in the home around the fire. The self-governing home and family must win the battle. And it begins in your heart. It begins in my heart. And the changing of the way that we think and getting back to this beautiful, biblical faith of our forefathers. <clears throat> Will you pray with me? Dear God, you gave us a brain. You created our mind. And Lord, it's, it's, we know that it's meant to be used not to deny you and to replace you but to comprehend the height and the depth and the width and the length and the breadth of your, your, your glorious power and your wisdom and your, the magnificence of your love and your kindness and your patience and your grace. For us to be able to comprehend that should send us into worship and praise and thankfulness. Lord, help us teach these things to our kids. Lord, we don't want to be dorky parents. We don't want to have awkward conversations. We don't want to be strict school masters and, and, and just turn them into religious rule keepers. We want them to be wild and free, creative and adventurous. We want them to be brave and compassionate. And these are things that we want them to learn. Help us to teach them and lead by example. 
thank you, Lord, for, for these moms and these dads who are sacrificing their lives to train their children. What a great joy to see our kids walk in truth. Help us to teach our grandchildren. Help us, Lord, to educate ourselves so that we don't get caught in the weeds and the, the political fray and, and, and fall captive to all of the headlines in the news and just wind up bitter, bickering people separating ourselves from family and friends. But people of, of reconciliation and bringing heaven to earth. We thank you for this, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you already know this by now, but um, we are uh, uh, making sure that we've got enough of the books and enough of these monuments. Uh, we've got the smaller personal size that's, uh, they're, they're being made as quickly as I can get them made and shipped off to you. And I'm so glad that many of you have already gotten your books and you're going through it. Um, it's just, it's the answer to my prayers to have you download all this stuff into your heart and into your mind and into your home. So thanks for joining me again tonight, and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow where we will talk about Liberty Man. See you then.